The message you're about to listen to is brought to you by the Enthronement House Christian Center, a church with a mandate to activate and actualize God's royalty in you. Fasten your seatbelt, get ready for a ride as God's servant brings you the anointed word of God that will change your life forever. And now, the ministry of the senior pastor, Enthronement Assembly, Reverend Deji Olabode. In Jesus' precious name, it's a great privilege to have you join us for the super celebration service of the Enthronement Assembly. I'm Ayodhi Jalabadi, the senior pastor of Enthronement Assembly, and I thank you so much for choosing to join us today. It is my prayer that at the end of this particular season, everything pertaining to you will be standing in the name of the Lord Jesus. My heart blesses you, and it's a great privilege to bring God's word to you there are a few things i want you to do for me this morning number one if you're at home right now where you're watching i like to gather everyone in your space every member of your family everyone connected to you and let's just gather around at around the table and hear and feast on god's word this last day in the name of the lord jesus number two if you're joining us this sunday morning from outside of lagos or you're joining us internationally i'd like you to indicate the particular nation where you're joining us from uh, as this will help us really uh, measure the global influence of what we're doing number three i'd like you right now to please help us start watch parties on all of your social media platforms so that we can spread the influence of what we're about to share this last day in the name of the Lord Jesus. And lastly, if you could do this for me, I'd appreciate it. If you have more than one, if you have more than, uh, if, if there are more than one person at this time watching with you, I'd like you to indicate the number of the people watching with you so that we can properly measure the influence of what we're doing this morning. As you do so, God will bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I, I believe in the story in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus Christ. Uh, took the boat of Peter and used the boat and the platform of Peter to address, uh, to preach the gospel. At the end of that, the Bible tells us he returned and blessed Peter's boat. And as you lend your influence, as you lend your platforms to us this Sunday morning, God will turn around and bless you in Jesus' precious name. Thank you so much and God bless you abundantly in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you have a Bible, I'd like us to go very quickly to the book of Joshua chapter 6 and verse 16, our anchor scripture for the month. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 16. And the seventh time it happened when the people blew the trumpet that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 14 to verse 17 is my second witness this Lord's day. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 14 to verse 17. The Bible says there was a little city with few men in it and a great king came against it and besieged it and built great snares around it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man and he by his wisdom delivered the city yet no one remembered that some that same poor man then i said wisdom is better than strength nevertheless the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard for emphasis the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard I want to speak briefly this morning on what I've titled How to Become a Financial Superpower. How to Become a Financial Superpower. Please bow your head with me. And let's pray this Lord today. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, very early uh, yesterday morning, you spoke to me that the finances of our people need your attention. Now, Lord, in obedience to that word, I'm asking that a now word will come in the name of the Lord Jesus. As a result of my time with them, let burdens be lifted, let yokes be destroyed, let revelation and understanding come in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And as a result of what will be shared today, O oh God, raise up financial superpowers, not only in this ministry, but in my generation and the world at large, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let somebody be able to trace their financial breakthrough to that which we're about to share right now. I ask, Father, for utterance. I ask for your help. I ask for entrance on their part. And I ask for dynamic signs and wonders following as a result of this word. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' precious name. And somebody says amen and amen. Once again, good morning. All right. Uh, we know that in Joshua chapter 6 verse 16, the Bible tells us that we are in that season where God has called us as a people to shout. And I've been saying for a while that before this month is over, my God will do something for you to shout about. There'll be so many things for you to shout about. Now, in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 14 to verse 17, I think verse 16 there says that there was a particular city that was besieged by a king from the outside. And the Bible said there was a poor man who by his wisdom delivered the city but the poor man was forgotten solomon the presumed author of ecclesiastes now said that wisdom is better than strength nevertheless the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard the connection between that and shouting is that he's saying very quickly that it will take a measure of prosperity for us to shout. The poor man's words or voice was not heard because of his financial stature. And ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to shout, if your business is going to shout, if a ministry is going to shout, if your gifting is going to shout, if your talent is going to shout, if your voice is going to be heard, it's going to be because by, by his mercy and grace, God has given you the privilege to access dimensions of finance that is that probably is unprecedented and i want to pray that in the name of the lord jesus as a result of my time of ministry with you this morning god will bring you into the realm of high finances in the name of the lord jesus god will honor your businesses with shouting finances god will honor your career your families with shouting finances in the name of the lord jesus god will begin to honor you with the dimension of finances we required for you to shout and so the bible tells us in ecclesiastes chapter 9 that because of his lack of prosperity the poor man's wisdom was despised and his words and his voice was not heard he did something but his voice was not heard because of the state of his prosperity hallelujah so as we begin to talk about financial prosperity ladies and gentlemen one scripture comes to mind in daniel chapter 8 and verse 25 in daniel 8 verse 25 the Bible tells us that through his policy, I'm reading, I think, from the King James Version. The Bible says, through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. So, prosperity does not only answer to prayers. Prosperity answers to policies. And through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And so the reason why I chose to have this broadcast from my office is because I felt that I'll be tempted to stand and preach it to you. But ladies and gentlemen, policies cannot be preached. Policies have to be taught. And so I'm trying to sit down today because I want to very specifically resist the temptation to preach it to you, but rather to bring a systematic understanding your way. If you're saying, Pastor, I want to prosper, then there has to be certain policies in place that will enable your craft to prosper, your business to prosper, your career to prosper. Listen to me. If those policies are not in place, you may love God, you may be holy, you may be righteous, but you're not likely to get the kind of results that you want. And so in Daniel 8, 5, the Bible says, and through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. 
Now, as, as I was praying about this service, God began to tell me some things and God said to me that the reason why many people are experiencing financial frustrations right now is because their financial expectations are not aligned with their financial administration or their financial administrations are not aligned with their financial expectations. So if you're saying I'm expecting this dimension of finance, then there has to be a corresponding financial administration that will birth that particular thing. And so you see a lot of people, all they're doing is expecting, expecting, expecting. And up to expectation in and of itself is not going to bring things to pass. For things to come to pass in terms of your prosperity, you must understand what I call financial administration. So for the next few minutes, what I want to share with you basically is pr principles of financial administration. Please, you may pray like we pray, but if you don't administrate like we administrate, you're not likely to get the results that we have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, I think verse 20, Paul said that no man blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. The abundance was not just acquired, the abundance was what administered. That no man blame us in the abundance, this abundance, which is administered by us. So there's a place of administration if you're going to come into a place of financial uh, prosperity. Also, financial administration will free you from frustration. So the reason why many are battling with financial frustrations today is because their financial expectations are not in tandem with their present financial administration. I pray that in the name of Jesus, as we teach this lost day, wisdom will hit you where you are to begin to properly administer finances to generate the results that God will have you generate in Jesus' mighty name. So it takes finance to shout, but it takes policies. It takes policies, valid policies for you to be able to prosper in this regard. So it says, and through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. Now the word policy is a very interesting word. The Hebrew word is sekel, S-E-K-E-L. Now the word there means discretion, the word means knowledge, the word means policy, the word means prudence, the word means sense, sense, the word means understanding, the word means wisdom and wise. So the word sekel is translated intelligence, discretion, knowledge, policy, prudence, sense, understanding and wisdom. Hallelujah. And so there are a lot of places, particularly most of the word, uh, most of the the, the 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 word for policy, the word sekel was translated as understanding in the Bible. Understanding, understanding. Now I'll give you about three scriptures where policy was translated as understanding. So in Job chapter fourteen, verse four, Job the first one is Job chapter 4, seventeen, rather verse four. In Job seventeen four, the Bible says, "For you have hid their heart." from understanding the word there is not understanding the word there is policy you will hit their heart from policies therefore you shall not exalt them so number one we see very quickly that your exaltation your financial exaltation and your overall exaltation is a function of the policies that you're living by if you can get the right policies in place you're not likely to come to that place of exaltation exaltation is connected to the policies that you're operating by he says you have hid their heart from understanding you've hid their heart from the right policies therefore shall you not exalt them hallelujah the second place where the word sekel appears in the bible you find in proverbs chapter 13 verse 15 Proverbs 13, verse 15. In the King James Bible, the Bible says, Good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Good understanding. But the word understanding there is the word policy, is the word sekel. So I can say that good policies give favor. So favor is not just something to pray for. Favor is also something to organize, to organize, to administrate for. Good uh, policies bring about favor. I'm wondering, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what favor is waiting right now for us to put the right policies and the right processes in place before they can be released? Sometimes we're praying and praying and praying <laughs> and we're not uh, organizing. And, and God knows that if he releases the answer to those prayers, we're likely to waste everything that he releases in our direction. So we say, number one, 
that good policies are responsible for exaltation, financial exaltation in this regard. Number two, good policies are, ex are, 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 are uh, responsible for financial favor. Financial favor, you can't separate the favor a person is walking in from the good policies that the person has adopted. Number three, you know, that good in Proverbs chapter 18, uh, 16, verse 22, the Bible says, Understanding is a wellspring of life unto the one who has it, but instruction of fools is fully. That is the word understanding is a policy. A policy, a good policy, is a wellspring of life unto the one who has it. A good policy is a wellspring of life. So what that means very quickly is that if you can find good policies, life can begin to to to, to uh, life can begin to emerge from the policies that you have put in place. Business life can begin to emerge. Professional life can begin to emerge. Life emanates from policies. So he's saying that good policies are a wellspring of life. Glory to God. So what I want to share with you this this morning about seven or eight policies as much as my time can take that you must put in place to be able to prosper now listen to me when you study the bible i don't have time to go through this but in every famine god's people prosper in every famine the people of god prosper so the the fact that there's a famine doesn't mean that you won't prosper in fact in jeremiah chapter 17 verse 4 all the way down the bible says blessed is the one who trusts in the lord come on he says he won't even see when heat comes he's not going to know what is happening because his trust is firmly anchored on the lord so what i want to share with you today are policies that we must put in place in our lives in our business in our ministries in our families to ensure that we come to a place or a realm of higher prosperity and i pray that in the name of the lord jesus wisdom will hit you right now come upon you right now to put the right policies in place in the name of the lord jesus and as you put these policies i'm about to share with you these seven or eight of them i'm about to share as much as my time can take as you put these policies in place god will honor you with prosperity in the name of the lord jesus and as you come to that place of prosperity your voice will be heard the voice of your giftings will be heard the voice of your business will be heard the voice of your of your enterprise will be heard the voice of what you're doing will be heard in the name of of the lord jesus i'm reminded now you know sometimes it's never the most gifted that thrives sometimes it's the most promoted have you noticed that before you is one thing to have the gifts but it's another thing to have the resources to promote that gift you can have there are many gifted people in our country but who lack the resources to promote their particular gift i won't mention a particular musician who i don't consider to be too excellent and all but then he came on the scene and then you know i mean because they have the money to promote it if you have the money to promote rubbish people will buy it and that's why we must be the kind of people who are beginning to trust. We do not underestimate the power of prosperity. Because I'm telling you, a lack of prosperity can silence our shout, can silence our voice. But that will not be you in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I looked at somebody and as I was praying about this, I'm going to use the life of Joseph as a template to draw out policies. Now, why am I using Joseph? Ha. I'm using Joseph because Joseph is perhaps the classic example of someone who understands what it means to be a global financial superpower in his time. One of the names given to Joseph was savior of the world, Zafnat Fania. Zafnat Fania means savior of the whole world. Listen to me, what, jo jo what Joseph built in his time commanded the attention of the entire world. The institution he led or he administrated command, thrived in the midst of... So if you're saying, I want to thrive in the midst of famine, you've got to take Joseph seriously. Of course, the life of Joseph also explains to us that when we talk about finance, we must understand that finance operates in cycles. There are cycles of abundance and there are cycles of scarcity. There are cycles of abundance and there are cycles of, of scarcity, cycles of, of, of greatness, cycles of famine. I don't have time to go through the dream that Pharaoh had. In Pharaoh's dream, come on, Pharaoh saw that there were fat cows and there were lean cows. And he saw that the, the cows, the lean cows ate up the fat cows and there was nothing left. Please listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. There are years that can eat up your years. There are cows that can eat up your cow. There are challenges that can eat up one's progress. So Joseph here represents somebody who stood strong, administrated effectively, 
And in the midst of the famine, his impact and his voice was heard and was felt. And the reason why Joseph succeeded, what did Joseph bring? What did Joseph put in place? Joseph's gift to Egypt was simply policies. Joseph's gift to Egypt were simply policies. I try to explain to people that it doesn't matter what is happening in the world. If you have the right policies in place, you will try. It doesn't matter the famine. It doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't matter the length. This is just a few months. This was a seven-year famine and Joseph's institution and his nation thrived because the right policies were in place. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that the policies that challenges meet matters. What determines what will stand or what will not stand is the policies that a particular challenge meet matters. And so instead of worrying about so these cycles, are real, there, will, there will be cycles of recession, there will be cycles of depression, there will be cycles of abundance, there, there are bull markets, there are bear markets. What matters is that we have the right policies in place so we know we are not at the mercy of whatever is happening in the world. And so what I want to share with us, ladies and gentlemen, this last day is certain policies that I want you to put in place on an individual level on a family level, on a professional level, on an institutional or a business level to ensure that what is happening right now will not sweep you up. Now, notice these policies should have been put in place for many before now, but it is never too late to do the right thing, which means if you've been doing your life without some of these policies right now, please put it, at least it will enable you to be in a better position when the next thing hits. Are you there? So what matters is not just what happens, it's the, it's the policies that the challenges that ha happen meet on ground that determines the portion of every single one of us. So I want to run through some of these things very quickly and um, I pray that God will give you understanding because I'm going to go run through very fast in Jesus' mighty name. The first policy you must have, ladies and gentlemen, is you must have a productive policy. You must have a productive policy or what I may call an earnings policy. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 33 to verse 34. <laughs> now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning man, a wise man, and set him over the land of Egypt. And let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. Please notice to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land, which means if the land had produced nothing, there would have been nothing to collect. This is why I differ with many in the church whose theology for prosperity begins with giving. Because if a person does not produce, there will be nothing to collect. There will be nothing to collect. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that God's plan for us did not begin with giving. In Genesis 1, God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish. So the first commandment God gave to man was the commandment of productivity. Now, what that means is that if you are not able to fulfill that mandate of initial productivity, then your pyramid of prosperity will collapse. So a lot of people are just talking about give, 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 give. Listen to me. If they don't produce, if they are not productive, there will be nothing to give. And that's why God began his, 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 his uh, dominion mandate, began with a productivity mandate. The first Thing you're going to have to do to attain pr prosperity is productivity. Productivity is the first rule of prosperity. Productivity is the first rule of prosperity. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's important, therefore, to fight for productivity, to fight. Because if you cannot pass the test of productivity, you will never be able to arrive and the privileges of prosperity. The first thing is product. So if you're saying, okay, I'm a business, are you a productive business person? I'm a, am I productive? The first question is, how can I be productive? Because sincerely, if you cannot get to that point where you're productive, then your equation of prosperity will totally collapse. This is one of the things driving the bitterness in many people in church right now. Because you told them, give, 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 give
So the first thing we've got to teach people is to teach them to be productive. Now, in dealing with productivity, productivity is a function of one problem solving. That's the first thing. The problems you're able to, to solve. The problems you're able to solve. And in doing that, you want to be able to solve the problems uh, uh, competently. Listen, there's a connection between your comfort in life and your competence. The more competent you are at what you do, it's not just doing something, but the more competent you are at what you are doing, the more comfortable you're likely to become. So in Proverbs, it says that a man that is diligent in his business, you see a man who is diligent in his business, the man is going to stand before kings and he's not going to stand before mere men. And if you stand before kings, you're going to command kingly resources. And so the first issue, ladies and gentlemen, in our equation for prosperity, equation of prosperity is to get to the point of productivity. And it's something to fight for. It's something to fight for. It's something to fight for. It's something to learn for. If you have to study to be productive, you have to study. I was showing some people and all that. And I said to them, lady, I said to them, I said, listen to me. I said, every particular field has its own Bible. So for instance, my own Bible, the Bible of my field is the Bible, but the technology guys have their Bible. And, you know, every other field, there's business has the Bible. Every, now, that doesn't mean that we all don't read the Bible, but then you have to be also a master of the definitive resource that drives productivity in your particular field. What is it? In many cases where people are not productive, they are ignoring the definitive resources in their particular field, and they're trying to, to create, create, create results, and it's not just going to work. So the first thing, ladies and gentlemen, is to, is to, is to become productive. I love Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. No, 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 said, for this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, he says, since the day we heard of it, and by the way, in Matthew 7, he says, therefore, by their fruit you shall know them, which means you can't be productive, you'll never be known. Can't get productive, can't be known. In Colossians 1 9, he says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That was the prayer point. That you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Then he says, being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So he's saying these are two different streams. You can have an increase in the knowledge of God and not be fruitful in every good work. So he's saying here, I want you both to have the knowledge of God, to increase in the knowledge of God. But I also want you to balance your knowledge of God by fruitfulness in every single thing you're doing. Because sincerely, if you cannot be fruitful, forget about prosperity. That's the foundation. That's the kindergarten. It's the elementary class in the school of prosperity. So I pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus, productivity, if you're going to be attain prosperity, productivity must become an obsession. You must, whatever you're doing, if you're a comedian, you must be a productive comedian. You're a technologist, you must be a productive one, not one giving excuses. You know your craft, you own your craft, you are good at what you do. And then the foundation is in place for you to move on to higher things in the area of prosperity. And so the first thing, ladies and gentlemen, is you must have a productive policy or an earning policy. Now, I also have noticed that you will attract resources to the degree to which you are productive. You will attract resources to the degree to which you are productive. So as you grow in your productivity, you begin to command certain dimensions of resources. And then, then you can now have the privilege of financial administration. Now, there will be nothing to administrate if you cannot get to the point of productivity. Glory to God. Glory to God. So in dealing with this, you're talking about product, product, problem solving. That's the essence of it. You need, you're meeting needs. You're solving problems. And then you are creating products and services for the exchange. You know, people talk about they want money and all that. You've got to have products. What product are you going to offer? You has to be products or services that you're offering. Right now, as I speak to you, we're rendering services towards people, nourishing your spirits wherever you are this, this particular law today. And so the first thing is law of prosperity or productivity. You must have a productive policy and an earnings policy, and you must fight for your productivity. Now, those who walk around me understand that anybody who toys with my productivity is an enemy. Anybody who toys with my productivity is an enemy. Because sincerely, that's the foundation of my prosperity. Make too much noise on that point. Now, as you as you are productive, productivity gives you the privilege of acquiring resources that you can now begin to administrate. I've made that point earlier. So as you acquire resources now, you're able to now administrate those, but if you don't acquire, you have no, no productive, there'll be nothing to acquire. Now, as we deal with this, the next policy I saw in Genesis chapter 41, Genesis 41 verse 33 to verse 30, 31, uh, 36, now therefore, 
This was Pharaoh. Let Pharaoh select a discerning man, a wise man, and set him over the land of Egypt. And let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one fifth of the produce. That's twenty percent of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of all those good years that are coming, and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. And let them keep food in the cities, that the food shall be as a reserve. Notice a reserve, a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt. That land mean that the land may not perish in the time of famine. Now, what he's saying basically is saying now that it is the it, 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 now they say now number two you have to develop a savings policy or a reserve policy a savings policy or a reserve policy so what he said to them he said now before joseph came there they were saving nothing now because prosperity is cyclical and seasonal it is in the order of god it is the years of abundance that are supposed to sustain us in the years of scarcity now the reason why this particular season is challenging for many people is that they had nothing saved they spent every single thing that came now, what that Bible calls that in Proverbs 21 10 is foolishness. There's much treasure in the Ghana, right? But the foolish man spends it up, spends it up. Which means anytime you finish spending it, the Bible says you are foolish. I, I didn't say so, the Bible said so. And so the reason why a lot of people may be stranded in this scenario where we're living right now is because when there was abundance, they had no savings policy, no reserve policy in place for their businesses. I want to challenge everyone connected to us, every businessman, every professional. Listen to me, the biblical minimum that you should save is 20%. 20%. And the reason is because, the reason is because if he saved 20% over seven years and he was able to survive for another seven years, he's saying the degree to which you save is the degree to which you survive. Now again, I'm going to come against some spiritual things, you know, because now a lot of people are saying things like, oh, you're supposed to give it all. No, you're not supposed to give it all. And God does not ask you to give it all. These are principles. Now, if I have time, I'll share this with you later. God is a God who reserves things. He reserves the weeks of harvest. There are snow. He has reserved for the day of battle. He reserves things. In Genesis chapter 7, in Genesis uh, chapter 7 and verse 11, there about when it was going to flood the earth, what the Bible says, the windows of heaven were opened, the fountains of the deep were broken up. Water came from God reserves things. God reserves. God reserves things. He doesn't just push it all out. Are you getting what I'm saying? So we, we must have a savings policy, a savings policy. So the re so, so why many are stranded right now is because when they had the abundance, the abundance that was supposed to finance the year of this scarcity, they were busy buying phones they didn't need to impress people that were not looking at them. They were busy wearing things that they could not afford. They were busy trying to impress people. They were busy trying to be popular. They were busy trying to do all kinds of stuff. And you cannot be effective financially if you are driven by the perception of people around. You know your state. You know your true state. You know your financial condition. You know what you, you can, your reality can handle. And so you are not moved by anything. I mean, I, I got a phone some time ago. And then, you know, I don't know my phone. Maybe a year or two ago and all that. Nothing's wrong with it. And uh, I'm not going to change that phone until it's no longer working. It's working now, so it's okay. And if it works for five years, I don't care how many brands are released before then. I'm not going to just keep it. So we have to be very conscious of this. That is better that you have acquired certain things <laughs> than that you're just impressing people. In this area, I'm talking about relationships. There are a lot of people looking that are not it. You have to be very careful, ladies. Ladies, I'm talking to you. Very careful. A lot of people sound it and not it. A lot of people look it and not it. A lot of people can impress, but they're nothing underneath. So it's important, therefore, for us to have a, a robust savings policy. And so, uh, uh, so we're talking now about minimum is 20%. Minimum is 20%. Minimum is 20%. And you see the same thing in Genesis 41 verse, verse 47, 41, 40, 47. Now in the seven plentiful years, the, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he, he gathered up all the goods of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. So he had the policy and he implemented it. 
Genesis 41, 33 to 36, he created the savings policy. Genesis 41, 47 to 49, he implemented it. There's no point having a policy that you won't implement. Are you there? So he, he gathered it and he put in the food cities and he laid up in every city the food of the field which was surrounded them. So he gathered from everywhere and gathered much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting. It was innumerable, immeasurable. So you see, he had, he had, he, he, so he came to Egypt before him. They were spending everything, wasting everything, using everything. Then he just said, now we're going to just save 20%. I'm wondering how would they have fed if they had saved 30? What if they had saved 40? What if they had saved 50? So the order of God is because resources are cyclical. Never being business is cyclical. So what you have to do is you have to use the seasons of abundance and allow, through a savings policy, use the seasons of abundance to finance the seasons <laughs> of, 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 of. So the tech, that's, that's the, so the tech thing is, so you have to have a, a savings policy. You know, and someone say, but what I'm earning is not enough. That doesn't matter. It is not the size of what you are earning. It is the principle applied to whatever you are earning that determines how big it's going to become. It's the principle. Not necessarily, not only the size. If you have something small, you apply the right policies to it, it will grow big. If you have something big, you apply the wrong policies to it, it's going to go down. So never say because it's small. If you're earning 1,000 a month, save 200 naira or other stuff and then put it somewhere where you can access it. And if you, don't, if you don't have the discipline to that, put it somewhere where it's, you cannot even reach it, even if you desire to do so. Hallelujah. So you have to have a, a, a savings policy. Very important. Business people, you, you have to have it. Professionals, you have to have it. Believers, you have to have it. So we, we I think we've done about maybe 150 or 200 families right now. And what we were amazed, you know, sometimes that you, you give somebody something last week and then the person is asking you for it this week. And we said, well, we have almost a, a thousand families to reach out to. If you got something this week, you, you should know how to ration it and not get stranded. Sometimes people are not stranded because God didn't supply. They are stranded because they didn't apply wisdom. God supplied, but they did not apply wisdom to what God supplied. And if you don't apply wisdom to what God supplied, then it won't matter. <laughs> uh, making, making too much noise this morning. Number three, you have to have a selling policy. That's number three. You have to have a selling policy. You must have a selling. Please note that word selling <laughs> policy. So in Genesis, we see very quickly, Genesis of the 41, verse 53 to verse 57. Notice this. I'm going to tell you here. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land ended. And listen to me, there's no everlasting plenty and things like that. There will be seasons and cycles. There will be cycles of abundance. And then ultimately, every, every industry has its maturity date and things like that. After a while, the revenues in a particular idea you know begins to wind up and then you have to know how to jump to there's no everlasting business there's no everlasting industry no matter what what we do so the seven years of plenty which were in the land ended and the seven years of, of, of famine began to come as joseph had said and the famine was in all the lands but in all the land of egypt there was bread do you see that because because they didn't have the policies when the famine hit they had nothing but because the right policies were in Egypt, Egypt had bread. Do you know that if you have the right policies, no matter what happens, no matter the challenge, you'll be provided for? He says, and then Egypt was Egypt. So when all the land of Egypt, so it now eventually proceeded to the land of Egypt was famine, and the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened the storehouse. I thought that Joseph would have given the Bible said Joseph opened the storehouse and sold, sold to the Egyptians what he collected from them. There's a certain rootlessness it takes for you to do business and to do to be successful financially. How could you have gathered it and then when it was time for us to need it, you were selling it? Do you know many Christians, many believers are too nice to do business? Too nice to do business. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. If you have people, listen, what you collected at a time when the need is there, you can sell at another time. We can learn on the value. When it was of no value to them, he acquired it. When it became of value to them, he sold it. Does that make sense? And that's business. That you acquire and collect it when it's of no value. 
<laughs> then when they realize their need for it, you place a price on it. Glory to God. You place a price. So he sold. He didn't give them. He sold it to them, to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in all the land of Egypt. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain. So he sold to his fellow Egyptians. Then he sold to all the nations. All the nations. Let me ask you a question. If you can't sell to your family, your family members, you are not a businessman. <laughs> if, if you can't sell to the people who gave you the position, then you don't want to do business. Because I'm wondering, you came to this place as a stranger. They made you our prime minister. And you, you, we acquired you. We came to you. We acquired, you acquired it from us. And then when we needed it, you sell it to us. It takes that measure of rootlessness for you to be financially successful. So you've got to have a selling policy. And everybody should sell something. One of my favorite scriptures in this regard, you'll find in Proverbs chapter 11, <laughs> verse 26. Please notice the scriptures, Proverbs 11, verse 26. It says, The people will curse him who withholds grain, but a blessing will be on the head of the one who sells it. What that means that there is not only prayer that is a blessing. You sometimes have to sell to be blessed. You have to what? Sell to be blessed. So you have to have a selling policy. I love Second Kings chapter four. You know the story of the the widow and Elisha. After the miracle, he said, "Go and sell the pro I perform the miracle now. From the proceeds of this miracle, go and sell." Now I'm wondering, you borrowed vessels from your neighbors to create this miracle. Now, when it's time, you are now selling it back to them. That's business for you. <laughs> That's business for you. In Luke chapter 19, even Jesus said something very powerful. Luke chapter 19, as he called 10 of his servants, 19 verse 13, and delivered to them 10 minors and said to them, do business with this till I come. So mandate, business is an eternal mandate till Jesus Christ returns. Do business till I come. <laughs> do business. And later, the Bible says he came back to find out how much they had gained by trading. The word do business, they try to do, do mind, to do, to transact, to transact. You know, one of the reasons why people don't like transacting, shame. 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 Please, if, you, if, if selling is, a, is shameful to you, uh, then revenues may be far from you. There's no shame in selling. Are you getting what I'm saying? There's no shame in selling. In fact, the more shameless you are about, the, about selling, the more, the more successful you're likely to be. I remember many years ago, we were pioneering a new church and all that. We had to begin to distribute flyers and all that. Many people don't do business because they are too timid. They are too afraid of rejection. Look, if you're going to be rich, you have to forget about shame and all that stuff. And I remember taking flyers and they giving to the giving, give, you give to one, give to two, one, throw it away. The fact that one throw it, throw it away doesn't mean the other one will not accept it. So you'll go next, 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 next. And there will be somebody that will say yes. It's like relationships and all that. If you keep asking people out, somebody will tell you yes. <laughs> I'm just too joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> but you need it, the temerity, the sagacity to continue asking. There's no, in those who buy it. Amen. Every, every plain boy knows, every player knows that if he puts on the pressure, at some point you cave in, either by agreeing or by, you start caving. I don't have the intention, but that's not that's my message right now. So sell something, go around your house and look for something to sell. Look for something to sell. Even this season, people are still selling. They are selling masks, they are selling all kinds of things. They are selling ventilators, they are selling things. Don't think there's any problem. Oh, some people are making money, they are selling online. They are selling, social networks are selling. Are you there? Uh, computers are selling. Now I just bought some for my family. Everything that is in tandem with this season, we sell. That's what I mean. There's no problem. There's no economic problem at all. Please wake up. There's no economic problem. It's just that the industries that are not in alignment with this challenge will go down. And the industries that are in alignment with this challenge will rise. So all it means is in this season, go and look for products and services that are in alignment with the challenge. And that's all. That's all. Now the student, the schools who have been trying to convince to develop online platforms who have not taken it seriously now no and are begging for fees around town and then you know that you know they're not so you go to them and say now you realize this is a need okay we we came to you the other time that you should we should help you with this particular site for educational 
program and you did not agree now the price is times 20 of what we offered you the other time and you have to pay it sell something you have to have a selling policy and you have to forget about any any sense of uh, of um you are exchanging value there's nothing shameful about the exchange of value provided the value does not violate the moral principle hallelujah number four i'm jumping on them so so you do that and all that you sell you must have a selling policy number four you must have a diversification policy there's no everlasting product or service except jesus there's no everlasting product or service you must have a diversification policy so in genesis chapter 47 and verse 16 and i've talked a little bit in genesis 47 verse 16 verse 17 then joseph said okay you said we're about to die they said okay so okay give your livestock and i will give you bread <laughs> So he, he, he began with bread. Then he diversified from bread into livestock. So I will give you bread for your livestock. And if the money is gone, you said you don't have money to exchange for the bread. Okay, give me your livestock. So he exchanged his bread for their livestock. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses and their flocks and the cattle of their heads and for their donkeys. So Joseph now had moved from bread, diversified. From bread, he moved into horses, he moved into flocks, he moved into cattle, he moved into donkeys. And then he fed them with bread in exchange of, of their, for their livestock all that year. But by that time, for that year, he had diversified from confectionaries into livestock acquisition. By Genesis 47 verse 18, the story had changed. Because if you have a consumption mentality, you will keep coming back. You will keep coming back. You, if you're just consuming and you're not producing, you're just consuming and you're and that's the problem. You're just consuming and you're not producing. You're just consuming. You're consuming and you're not producing. You're just consuming. All you are doing is waking up consuming. <laughs> consuming electricity. Consuming water. And you're not producing anything. You will soon be in debt. Once the rate of consumption exceeds the rate of production, you'll be indebted. Once again, once the rate of consumption exceeds the rate of production, you're on your way to indebtedness. So, you, 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 so understand that you have to consume. You can't live without consuming. So you have to make sure that the rate of your production exceeds the rate of your consumption. And that's the only reason why you're going to be productive as a, as a leader, as, as, as a person. Look at verse 18 of that. Story. When the year had ended, they, they, the consumers came again the next year and said, we will not hide from my Lord <laughs> that our money is gone. And my Lord also has our heads of our livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. <laughs> he said, why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land <laughs> for bread. You see, consumers? And our land will be servants of, will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die. And I'll teach about that some other day. And the land may not be desolate. And Joshua bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every man of the Egyptians sold his property, his field. And because the famine was severe upon the land, so the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into cities from one end. Because if you are a consumer and not a producer, you can be moved anyhow. <laughs> you can be moved. Either a professional, you're just consuming, you're not producing. Listen to me, you are not secure if you're just a consumer. So he was moving them anyhow. But we see here, this man, Joseph, diversified. That's what I'm talking about. You need a diversification policy. Now, notice what we're saying. Please don't get too attached to any particular business. Don't get too attached. What, what is value migrates? So what is working now may not work tomorrow. Don't be too loyal to the business. Yeah, what I know is what I know. Come on, calm down. So the guy moved from confectionaries, diversified to livestock, horses, this and that. Then he moved from that to real estate. Then he moved from real estate to human estate. He bought them. <laughs> he bought them in their bodies. May God raise Joseph for me in this house. In the name of the Lord Jesus. So, of course, number five, I won't stay longer. You need a reorganization policy. Now he had bought them. He had bought their resources. He had bought their land. The land was his. The people were his. So he could move them around. That's called urban renewal. Have you? Move them in a way that will suit him and serve his strategic intent and his purpose. You need that. Number six, as we begin to bring my story to a close, you must have what I call a sacerdotal policy. Sacerdotal, S-A-S-E-R-D-O-T-A-L. 
uh, is a confusing word for priest. Priest, you must have a sacerdotal. You're going to prosper. You must have a sacerdotal policy. So in Genesis chapter 47, in the midst of all of this, outsmarting them, doing business, putting policies in place, Genesis 47 verse 22 says, only the land of the priest he did not buy. For in spite of the famine, the priest had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. So the only land that was safe from transaction were the land of the priests, so that they could continue to do what God had called them to do in that particular time. There's something very powerful there. Please don't do business with priestly resources. There are certain things that belong to God, things like the tithe, things like the prophet offerings, things, things that are stipulated, parents' offerings, things that are stipulated in the word, things that are priestly portions, things that have to do with the Lord. Please, don't say, eh, eh, I'll do this, I forgot my time. Don't do that, please. In the, and don't use the famine as an excuse to neglect divine and spiritual principles and covenant practices the reason is because it is through those covenant practices that the invocation of grace can rest on all of your other initiatives i want to believe that the reason why most of his other unspiritual initiatives worked was because he had given the priest's portion so the priests were there praying the temples were taken care of and they could be invoking certain things. It would be very foolish, ladies and gentlemen, to stop giving to God because there's a crisis. But notice I didn't start with giving. Like, it's like policy number six. Because if you have nothing, there will be nothing to give. But then, in the proceeds of it, you must understand that you must give your priest a place. You must give God his place. You must not joke with this particular. I'm taking so much time today. But please, very important. So you're, you must have sacerdotal principles, policies in place. Give to Jesus what pertains to Jesus. Give to your church what pertains to your church. Give to your ministers what pertains to your ministers. At least that will enable that there is prayer over your life as you do other things. But that's not for today. That's not for today. Number seven, as I begin to round up my story, you will need a reinvestment policy. You need a reinvestment policy. So after he put all of these things in place financially, we now see in Genesis 47 verse 23 to verse 26, then Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you, and I have bought your land today for Pharaoh. Look now, here is seed. Now, in this point, he was no longer trading. He was now investing back seed into them. And look at what he said. He says, You shall sow the land. And I have bought the land, and it shall come to pass in the harvest of the land, you shall give one fifth to Pharaoh. And for fifth shall be for your own, as your seed, for the field, and for your food, and for those of your household, and as for food for your little ones. And they said, you have saved our lives. Here you're seeing that he began to reinvest. And this is the big deal. Where in the beginning he was selling and acquiring, now he got seed from what he had acquired, and then now became what I would call a venture capitalist. And he retained a 20% equity in everybody who was in Egypt. Imagine how rich that king would have become. Here he was now like a venture capitalist with a 20% stake in everybody's effort. <laughs> That's reinvestment. But the reinvestment is in four levels. Number one, he said, of your in the harvest, and I'll talk about it maybe sometime later. He says, when you have the harvest of it, from the harvest, take 20% and give it back to Pharaoh. Why? Why will you give it back to Pharaoh? Because the seed came from Pharaoh. This is where many people get into trouble. Wh whoever is the source of your breakthrough must retain a modicum of that breakthrough for it to continue to self-perpetuate. You can't become greedy. So, for instance, if God is the source of your breakthrough, you can't now, if you are now greedy, at the God who gave you the breakthrough, you are going to lose it. 
The same way if you have business partners, if you have business investors who are the source of the recovery, you cannot get stingy. There are a lot of people who get greedy with the source. And so what happened was he, he said, 20% of this, I'm going to take 20%, then give 20% back to the source. If your source is Pharaoh, give to Pharaoh what is Pharaoh. If your source is God, give to God what is God. You see, this is, because if you don't give back to the source what belongs to the source, it will cut off your supply. And once it cuts off your supply, that's why people have that's why people have single breakthroughs. They don't know how to give back to the source. For us as Christians, we know that God is the source of everything. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. So there is a percentage of everything that he must have. It's a principle. It's a principle. The second level, so the source, that's, I call it sorcery investment. The second level financial is self-investment. So it says, it shall come pass in the harvest, you shall give one fifth to Pharaoh, four fifth shall be your own. There are many people who do everything and they give nothing to themselves. Nothing to themselves. This is wrong. Nothing for you. And the way you do that, probably saving and there must be something for you. The third level is, so self-investment, second level, self-investment. Third level is seed investment, which means that particular thing that you are doing now, there must be a part of what you are doing that you should reinvest back into that thing. You are not just taking away from business. The, that business, you should reinvest back in the tools. The business where you got that particular problem from, there should be something you put back in the business. Maybe buying tools, maybe buying equipment, maybe buying things. There are a lot of people doing a lot of things, not buying anything for that business. That's why the business is fighting you. So, number one is source investment. Source investment, self-investment, seed investment. You are plowing it back, reinvesting it so that it can be compounded. The fourth now is subsistence, which is the last. Here you take care of your family and things like that, making sure that your family is in good order. You know, when you're doing business, you have to neglect your family. That family can destroy you, you know. So you take care of your children, you take care of your wife. And all that. He says, so for fifth goes towards that. 20% has gone back to the source. The for fifth, you take care of subsistence, your, your family and things like that. Make sure that, you know, you're, doing this, you're saying there's an excuse. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, you need a legislative policy. So in Genesis 47, verse 26, the Bible tells us, and Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt. So he didn't just enter an agreement with them. He made it a law. Please, let me explain this to you. Please, don't just enter agreements without legislation. There's no relationship as emotional as marriage. Yet, the Bible says, in a marriage relationship, that is emotional. Romans 7 said, the husband is bound by law. So if law is relevant to an emotional relationship, won't the law be relevant to a financial relationship? So you ensure that you enter no agreement with no one without signing the dotted line. So he entered it as a law over the land of Egypt that Pharaoh should receive one fifth, except for the land of the priest only, which did not become Pharaoh's. Ladies and gentlemen, so you need a legislative policy. And I think my time is up, I'm taking too much time today. So what you want to do, it takes policies to prosper. Go put these policies in place. Go put these policies. Did I say a giving policy? I must, have, I must have said that. I must have said that. When he gave to the priest, that's a giving policy or a sacerdotal policy. I've said that. So go put all of these policies, not one of them, but with all of them embedded into what you are doing. And my God will prosper you in the name of the Lord Jesus. This year will be a year of unprecedented wealth in the name of the Lord Jesus. Many of you will come into dimensions of wealth that will shake your generation in the name of the Lord Jesus. No one connected to us will be poor in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wisdom will be given to you to command the wealth of the nations in the name of the Lord. Let a mantle of wealth rest upon you right now. You will know what to do. You will know where to turn. And even in the midst of this particular condition, you will thrive. Your business will thrive. Your finance will thrive. Your family will thrive. Your career will thrive. Even if you lose that job, God will open up all that doors in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you will not fail. Through his policy, it shall cause craft to prosper in his hands. God bless you. In Jesus' mighty name. You're saying, Pastor, I need to reconcile with the Lord. Yes, I'm going to pray for you. That's why we're here. Listen, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to reconcile with the Lord. Pray for me. If that is you, please say these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that God raised you from the dead. Therefore, right now, I am saved and born again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name.
offering. I'll be back to pray for you and your family after the offerings. God bless you abundantly. In Jesus' name. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm sure your word came this Lord's day. And please, it's not just in the hearing, it's in the doing. Hallelujah. It says, now that you know these things, then you're blessed. You'll be blessed if you do them. I pray that it do as mantle will rest upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's my privilege uh, to ask you to please follow us on all of our social media platforms. Please, you're also going to see some things we're beginning to send out, some content we're beginning to send out on social media. Please share with your, your world if you believe in that, that what we're sharing here. And I pray that God will honor you abundantly in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to pray for your finances specifically this Lord's Day. And there are other things you're trusting God for. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. If, if that is you, just stretch your hands, touch the screen, and let us agree. Father, in the name of Jesus, you spoke to me to give them this word. Now begin to attend to the finances of our people in the name of Jesus. Over everyone listening to me right now, go ahead of them. Make every financial crooked place straight. Break in pieces the gate of brass. Caught us under the bars of iron. Give them the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places to confirm that this word came from you, O God. Honor them with the greatest testimonies of wealth they have ever had. In the name of the Lord Jesus. If there be any sick there, I command that body to be healed. In the name, touch it right now. In the name of Jesus, I command that particular part of your body to be healed. In Jesus' mighty name. If there be body I command those burdens to be lifted. If there be yokes, I command the yokes to be destroyed. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And I command you to be blessed. In the name of Jesus. Let the wisdom, the favor, and the grace of a financial super power rest upon you right now in the name of jesus i command your career to be blessed i command your business to be blessed i command your efforts to be blessed and i declare that these words are confirmed in your experience in jesus mighty name i pray amen love you so much god bless you in jesus precious name let's share the grace and fellowship may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit build us now and forevermore amen tell somebody surely god's goodness and mercy is following you all the days of your life, you're dwelling in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining me this morning. God bless you abundantly. This week will be a week of answers for you in the name of Jesus. The gates are lifted up before you in the name of Jesus. I will share your testimony this week in the name of Jesus. It's a new season. I love you. You're in my prayers. 